Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Unboxing Tomorrow Adventure in Electronic Robotics and Communication Systems, where after a considerable break, it is finally time for that long-anticipated unboxing of the PinePhone Beta Edition. What is PinePhone exactly? You may be aware that Android is a Linux-based operating system, although it's tough to realize its full potential, and even if you root the phone, there are plenty of barriers built into the OS and its configuration that makes the system difficult to customize. PinePhone, on the other hand, has the idea of customization built directly into the platform itself. The phone in this video came here with the user-friendly Linux distribution Manjaro ARM, and yet PinePhone users have their own pick of at least 20 different operating systems, and changing the OS completely is about as simple as using a microSD card or reflashing the onboard memory. This unboxing is going to be a little bit more basic, and I'm hoping it gives you an idea of what to expect if you decide to buy this for yourself. PinePhone is a product of Pine64, and as of this video, I am not affiliate with Pine64 in any way other than being an ordinary customer. This video will have a lot to cover, so if you find it useful or want to see more, be sure to share the video or let me know if I should make a part 2, and better yet, let me know if you've tried this phone for yourself. The Pine64 company is pretty clear that the phone is still in beta, meaning that how the system works is still subject to change, and videos like this one can become dated and awkward. If it helps clarify, this was recorded August 2022, and you can get the written version on the unboxing Dash Tomorrow website. As for material requirements, you are going to of course need a subscriber identity module or SIM card. However, there is a short list of wireless carriers whose SIM cards are known to not work with the phone, at least not without some kind of modification. That list is maintained on the PinePhone wiki page. Pine64.org is what you might call a information hub for this and other Pine64 products, and Pine64.com is the official storefront. This particular unboxing happened in North America using the AT&T wireless network. Besides the SIM card and the phone itself, I do recommend having an anti-static workstation, something I recommend for pretty much anything electronic, a wireless network that you can access as administrator, in fact this could even be a mobile hotspot from another phone, and a small Phillips screwdriver. The latest PinePhone iteration is in fact geared toward experienced Linux users, so you are probably ready for something like this if you know basic terminal commands, or if you're already a Linux user. The package arrived from Hong Kong, and after you remove the outer layer, you should be able to find basic descriptions of the phone's capabilities, and we can read from the box that this does support wireless 4G waveform. The box itself contains six different items, the phone, the readme card, the manual for important information about the battery and how to remove the back panel, the USB-C cable, a nano SIM to micro SIM card adapter, and because I purchased the convergence package, there's also a docking crate which has ports for USB, HDMI, and wired Ethernet. Above all, you want to make sure you never discard any type of battery of any chemistry in the ordinary trash. For lithium batteries, this is a fire hazard, so it's best to find some type of professional who can dispose of those for you. The back panel of the phone will have to come off, and because of this, I strongly recommend reading and understanding both the README file and the manual. Better yet, the wiki page has a quick start guide, along with specifications for the phone. On the lower right hand corner, you can check for a notch where you can pry apart the back cover, make sure to not overbend the plastic, and when you have the back cover separated, you can see the battery, the dual card holder, the I.O. pins, and the phone's kill switches. First things first, there is a insulating tape that will insulate the battery from the rest of the phone. This is placed here in order to keep the battery from discharging while it's in shipping, and even if you try to power the phone over USB, it apparently will not power on until that tape is removed. Now, for me, this is where I ran into trouble, because the battery was completely wedged into position, and even when I followed the wiki by removing the four screws, which might work for some people, the battery was still stuck in position, and I could only remove it by using a double-sided tape and lifting it up out of position with some considerable force. Clearly, I don't want to do that every single time, so I took a strip of anti-static tape and wrapped it around the battery so that next time, I can simply unpeel part of the tape and pull the battery out of position. Before putting the battery back, it's a good idea to put in the SIM card and the microSD if you plan to use it. Carefully place your own SIM card in the nano SIM adapter, 
taking care to not get fingerprints or oil on the gold contact. There should be a graphic next to the card holder that tells you which card goes on which layer. If you get the order wrong, this can damage the contacts, so be careful that you know what you're doing. The kill switches are included so that users like us or developers can selectively disable or enable different wireless functions, including cellular, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the microphone, the front or back cameras, and interestingly enough, the final switch controls the UART, which is wired to the headphone port. By default, this port is in audio mode, and if you want to have a UART port for debugging purposes, the switch is how you get that port activated. In addition to that, there's also an I2C port, and you can find this on the gold-plated contacts, although the power delivery for this port is a little bit unusual, so you should read the manual before you poke around. By the way, if you want to use one of those alternate operating systems, a bootable micro SD card is how you do it, but for a basic unboxing like this one, everything I needed was already pre-flashed onto the onboard eMMC card, so the microSD was completely optional. At that point, I could just put the battery back in place, snap the back cover on, charge up the phone for a while, and power on the system by holding the power button. If everything goes well, you should see the onboard LED cycle through a couple colors. There will be a animated logo, and since it's your first time, you'll do basic configurations for your time zone, Wi-Fi setup, and your Linux username and password, which is probably also going to be the unlocking pin, so make sure it's a numeric code. After a short wait, the phone should load up the Plasma user interface. If you don't recognize these applications, I've created a list that summarizes their capabilities, and you can find the link to this in the video description. But the most important ones are probably going to be the web browser Angelfish, the package manager Discover, which is effectively the App Store, the text messenger Spacebar, the terminal, and of course the phone app, which is probably where you want to start. If there's any trouble with your wireless carrier, this is where you're going to see an error message, and in my case it does take a couple minutes for the internet connection to stabilize. Swiping down from the top of the screen will reveal additional options, and if you need to shut down or reboot, you can do so by holding the power button for a few seconds, or you can hold it down for an extended period of time for a hard shutdown. Now, in my case this was almost as far as I was able to get, because while I was connected to Wi-Fi, I encountered a bug that would cause the lock screen to appear practically any time I touched the screen. The pin was accepted every single time, but the screen would lock again, and the only solution that worked for me was to either get out of range of my wireless network, or access the phone remotely over secure shell. If you see my videos on Raspberry Pi, this is effectively the same technique that I use, and I do recommend having some SSH experience, or you can refer to that Raspberry Pi project, because it's pretty much the same procedure. Access a computer that's on the same network as the Pine Phone, find out your local IP address that the Pine Phone is using, and then use an application like Putty or Linux Terminal to log into your Pine Phone user account using the password you created earlier. The other rough patch that I ran into is that for the first time that back panel was extremely difficult to remove, so I eventually had to use a screwdriver. This seems to be a hit and miss feature, because I've seen other people pry this panel off with very little effort. It is easy to remove now. Going forward, I do plan to cover this again, so be sure to check in often, stay posted for the next one, and as always, have a great day.